Welcome to Franchise Empires, where aspiring entrepreneurs learn exactly what it takes to become a successful franchise owner from one location to 10 and beyond. I'm the Wolf of Franchises. Hey everyone, it's the Wolf. Today I have a super exciting guest for you. Dan Reese is the CEO of a new franchise called Milkshake Factory. This franchise has a fascinating backstory that involves a family out of Pittsburgh who's built a premium chocolate empire. And I'm talking multi-hundred million dollar brands that are sold via Costco, all from their chocolate products. But this family's knack for creating rich dessert treats has since expanded to milkshakes. Dan gives us their incredible origin story, as well as his personal background and how he met the family when he was working at Kraft Heinz as a partner. Overall, I think the combination is pretty killer, and Milkshake Factory is a really interesting case study on how to build a simple business that has very high potential, and Dan gives it all to us. Enjoy. The Wolf of Franchises is the CEO of Wolfpack Franchising, as well as a creator at Workweek Media. All opinions expressed by The Wolf and podcast guests are solely their own opinions, and do not reflect the opinion of Wolfpack Franchising or Workweek. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. The Wolf, Workweek, and Wolfpack franchising may maintain positions in the franchises discussed on this podcast. And there's a lot of places we could start, but I think the Ed- Edwards family is like an interesting start. So I know, you know, we were just saying they're fourth generation chocolatiers, but can you just give me some insight into their background, their story, how they originally even founded Milkshake Factory? Sure. So like you said, I mean, they're fourth generation chocolatiers, you know, way back in 1914, uh, you know, they're great, 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 however many generations immigrated from Greece through Ellis Island. And a lot of those Greek immigrants, uh, you know, didn't have, they had no money and, but they had skills and a lot of skills actually in candy making. So long story short, they actually settled in Pittsburgh and had a little small candy business. So that's kind of how the the family business started way back in 1914, you know, a little candy shop, you know, making it in the back, just kind of making, making ends meet. So kind of one of those classic entrepreneurial immigrant stories. And then the business kind of took many turns over generations, uh, you know, that their, uh, the Edwards family's parents had a big fundraising business, but always in chocolate. So different brands, um, different models, et cetera, but it was always all about the product. And then Dana, uh, who's the co-founder of, or the founder of Milkshake Factory, her mom had a little chocolate shop in Pittsburgh uh, called Chocolate Celebration. It's like a little retail chocolate business. Uh, and you know, if, if it's not Valentine's Day, Easter, or holiday, it's a pretty tough business to be in. I mean, it's July yeah. in Pittsburgh. You're not not doing a whole lot at the local chocolate shop. So Dana, in her college project, uh, had the idea of like, what if we started scooping milkshakes in the summer? I mean, the, the downside is zero. The sales are zero. We might as well give it a shot. Uh, and and they have, they're such product experts and they're so obsessed with quality. Their milkshakes actually ended up being pretty fantastic. Now, it was, it was pretty scrappy. It wasn't very sophisticated, but the shakes were great and they started to take off. So, you know, in, in mom's little chocolate shop, just started scooping some shakes and, you know, sh- shakes for 5% of sales and then 10% and then 20%. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of years, they realized milkshakes were actually a better business to be in than a little chocolate shop. So I'm oversimplifying a bit, but then they rebranded it Milkshake Factory. And then that percentage of sales actually flipped to the majority was milkshakes. But the heart of the Milkshake Factory was still mom's chocolate shop. So, and we'll get into this later, but uh, yes, we're a milkshake shop. Milkshakes are the thing, but we also are the community's chocolate destination for their for the chocolate. Um, so that was that happened uh, probably about twenty years ago. Was that small little evolution for one little store retail footprint store in Pittsburgh, and then uh, the fourth generation, um, Dana and her two brothers actually were did not go into the family business after college, and they actually all went to Washington D.C. Uh, for careers in the White House. So they actually worked their way up through the White House, very prominent careers in the George W. Bush administration. I mean, crazy stories around flying on Air Force One and 9-11 Ground Zero. They visited 85 countries. They were in charge of presidential advance, which basically means uh, planning the logistics of the president everywhere he travels. So you can imagine how intense that is and how detailed oriented that is. So they learned a lot through that. And then you know, as that administration ended, they looked to get back into the family business. That was kind of their, always their calling to, to leave these high profile careers in DC, come back to the family chocolate business. 
And, you know, as part of that, and again, to be clear, this was not some chocolate empire. I mean, I give them all the credit for doing this. They, they left. I mean, it was back to their grandparents' old factory, which was tiny. Their, their conference room table was a moving box flipped upside down. I mean, they all shared a <laughs> phone. There was maybe a couple hundred grand in revenue. I have no idea how they paid themselves. You know, so it was tiny, tiny, wow. tiny. So it wasn't like, oh, we're going to come back to the empire and make our money. I mean, they started essentially from scratch. So I give them a lot yeah. of credit for taking that leap of literally flying around an Air Force One with the president to, you know, back to grandpa's old chocolate factory sharing a phone. So, um, yeah, you know, that was a big leap for them to take. <laughs> and what, what year was that when they decided to leave the, that the was White probably, House world? I think around 2008, give or take. So about 2008. So on the scale of like launching a company, I mean, chocolate company for that. And, and I guess with milkshakes, uh, being sold too, but like, yeah, it's not, I mean, not that I, I was thinking that this was like, you know, the biggest chocolate business in Pennsylvania. Uh, no. I guess that's actually worst right. take ever because Hershey's is there. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that, they're hard to beat. They're not second biggest, maybe. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah, second biggest. But yeah, I didn't realize the scale. I, I figured it was uh, a bigger operation well, even around well, that time, 12 years ago. It got ago. there, right? But so, you know, they started from the ground floor and then they kind of, you know, refined the operation and they came up with some nice products and, you know, it's a bunch of old ladies hand-making chocolate in the basement of an old movie theater. I mean, think like really old school chocolate operation. But, you know, to their credit, they got into, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue and Dean and DeLuca, and they kind of grew their little premium chocolate business um, a little bit, which was great. And then they also won the bid for the Pentagon. Uh, so the Pentagon is, the, I believe, the biggest office space in the country. And they, it is actually this weird little retail environment within the Pentagon, you know, all these restaurants, because the employees can't leave, right? It's the most secure place yeah. on the planet. So long story short, they actually won the chocolate shop bid for the Pentagon, and they opened up a premium chocolate retail shop. Uh, again, inside the walls of the Pentagon. So it was literally the most secure chocolate shop in the world, <laughs> which is a pretty cool story. But if you think about yeah. it from a business perspective, it's a captive audience and there's nowhere to go and people need their gifts and their Valentine's chocolate sure. or whatever to take home. So they were actually phenomenally successful in the Pentagon. And then they actually got a nice write-up, uh, I think a year later, in I think it was the, well, some big Washington publication of their story. It's, you know, siblings leave White House, start chocolate business, et cetera, et cetera. And that's when the Costco buyer in the Northeast uh, saw that article and was like, oh, this is really cool. And she actually happened to be from Pittsburgh and was like, I have to meet these people. So yeah. you know, he took this meeting with Costco and had no idea what consumer products were. They'd never, you know, done packaging or pallets or any of that stuff. It's this whole new world. But Costco, to their credit, is all about product quality, right? So they sat there. The buyer is like, what do you guys do best? They said, oh, it's our grandpa's caramel recipe. And they're like, okay, great. Let's innovate around that. So uh, they kind of co-created this item called Snappers, which is a pretzel caramel chocolate cluster with Costco. And they were approved for 81 clubs on the spot, uh, which is wild because like, if you think about the scale, it's a bunch of like little old ladies making hand-making chocolate in the basement of a movie theater to now they have to ship tractor trailer loads of product to Costco, right? Which is a, yeah. a scale leap that most people don't understand unless you've been there. <laughs> so, and they had, I think it was three months to hit that delivery. And again, if you actually understand the math of production volume and quantity and output, like it, it was almost an impossible task. But to their Holy credit, I mean, crap. they hand welded their own enrobing lines and true entrepreneurial grit. Like, like we are not going to fail. This is going to happen. And, and, and again, like to be clear, if you miss that shipment for Costco, I don't care if you're big or small, like game over, you can't do it. Right. So the stakes yeah. could not, it will hire the, the, the great story of that truck for Costco is up against their factory about to pull away. They're begging the driver to not drive away. And they're like running the last bags onto the truck. So, I mean, you know, it's like those cooking shows where they make it with, you know, three seconds to spare or something. Yeah, so exactly. Pull it off. I mean, wild. And I give them all the credit, just a wild, the kind of entrepreneurial grit, like we are not going to fail and they made it happen. And then of course the product starts selling like wildfire and then they rapidly expanded across the country um, with snappers across Costco and the volumes got pretty big, pretty quick. So Costco is very powerful in that regard. And then, you know, we can get into my background in a second, but that's kind of when I came onto the company as the, the business expert. So kind of help them yeah. scale that uh, chocolate business from essentially zero to about 50 million in revenue. And, you know, we were on the Inc. 5,000 fastest growing companies in America for six straight years. So 
you know, and while this was happening, you know, mom's little chocolate shop that was now the milkshake factory was just in the background. It was just one little retail store in Pittsburgh. And then we'll get into the milkshake factory story in a second. But, um, you know, milkshake factory was not the focus at the time. And it wasn't until the big inflection point for milkshake factory was in 2016 when PNC Bank was building their global headquarters, you know, greenest building in the world, downtown Pittsburgh, and they just didn't want another national retailer. They didn't want Starbucks in their lobby. They wanted something very interesting and local. So they came to us saying, hey, we want Milkshake Factory in, in our building, the retail space. And we kept saying, you know, no, 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 it's too busy. It's, you know, too busy. Uh, and we kept turning them down. And then long, eventually we acquiesced and then, and then put our second store with all updated branding and kind of did it yeah. the right, you know, evolved out of mom's chocolate shop. Um, and that still is one of our flagship stores to this day. And it was wildly successful. And that was kind of the point when we realized, huh, like, you know, maybe we're onto something with milkshake factory. So, um, sure. I'll pause there for sure. a second. There's kind of a lot to unpack, but there's some, some converging paths of different businesses here. <laughs> Just, yeah, no, I mean, it's fascinating. I feel like this should be a documentary on the Edwards family. <laughs> and uh, it's it's really interesting. I mean, and, and so, all right, just to be, I mean, the one, the entrepreneurial story of just like hitting that Costco order, like that's insanity. Yep. Uh, incredible that they pulled it off. But so Snappers that like I Googled it while you were talking, um, that that's, so that's just a Costco. It's like, a, it's a co-created product between Costco and uh, the Edwards family and their chocolate it, business. And that's the I, only place it's sold? No, no, no. So it's a, it's a national brand now. And we, we have since exited that business a couple of years ago. So there's no oh. owner. Um, so it, and by co-created, I mean, the buyers of Costco sometimes like to create, oh, change this little thing of the product, change this packaging. So that's what I mean by co-created, but it was done. It. it was the okay. Edwards family's business. So it wasn't some sort of co-branded thing, but that's how we started in Costco. But then when I came on, I mean, Target, Walmart, CVS, you know, Kroger, Everyone all wanted the big it. retailers were in Sappers. And then we actually launched a second brand as well called Edward Mark Chocolatier that ended up being even a little bigger. Um, and that's still a big Costco brand. Um, you know, a lot of folks like had the coconut almonds, which actually are national in Costco right now. So again, we are no longer involved in the chocolate business. You know, I still root for that business from the sidelines. I, I bought, bought a bag of coconut almonds this week just to, to check in on them. Um, so yeah, it's, it, Costco is the best customer and biggest, but it's it's not the only one for that business. But again, we are we have since exited that business. Wow. Okay. So that's really interesting. And I want to get into how you met the Edwards family and how that developed. But before, I'm just really curious about this chocolate business. I mean, I'm listening to this and because you said, right, that uh, it wasn't a massive business, like, you know, back as far as 2007, 2008, and really hadn't taken off yet. Um, I mean, what... It, obviously, I guess like the the kids came back, they started expanding it, and I know you said they got that like contract inside the Pentagon. So, um, and that led to the the press release, which then the yep. Costco buyer saw, and there's a Pittsburgh connection. But I'm listening to this, so like, just I guess, um, you know, uh, tell me why I'm an idiot here, because I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm like, wait, like, what, if they didn't really have a big chocolate business yet, like, if there's listeners out there thinking, like, oh, why don't I start some type of like CPG business and like. Because it didn't seem, is it the quality of the product? Is that really that good? Like, is that what the differentiator is here? Because I, I think there's a lot of like food businesses that kind of tout like, oh, this is my great, great grandfather's recipe and it's it's better than everyone else's. But it's like, hey, man, that's a commodity product. Let's be honest. Um, yep. But like, obviously, they've had a lot of success. And I could tell like you said Saks Fifth Avenue, like they have some type of premium element to it. So is that a, a massive differentiator here in, in, in this success? It's like that it, it truly is like you can't just replicate this. Yeah, or... I, I think I think yes and no. So I think you're right. You know, everyone talks about we're the oldest, whatever, and you know, we're the best. And, and again, in some yeah. cases, yes. And, and they might even be right. Does the consumer care enough <laughs> for that to really differentiate you? That's really the question to be asking. And the answer yeah. is maybe. So I think I view that as, you know, grandpa's caramel, caramel recipe. Like that's table stakes. Like, okay, you have to have that. In today's world, I don't care if you're in retail or CPG, but if you're in food and your product is not great, not good, great, if not the best, like don't, don't do anything until you have that box checked. But that box alone does not guarantee you anything, right? So that's table stakes. And I think really to kind of get at your question, you know, Dana's older brother, Chris, you know, he is a master relationship builder and he is, I call him the Costco whisperer. Like, you know, he was the one that can walk into this meeting 
and just make it happen. Right. And, and even myself, and we'll get my background in a bit, like, yeah. you know, I we used to lead a massive portfolio at Kraft Heinz and we had a hard time with Costco, right? Like, oh, but we're Heinz ketchup. Like they didn't care. Right. Like I used to go in there and get beat up by Costco quite a bit. And my first meeting with Chris Edwards, I walk in, I'm like, oh, here we go. I'm about to get my face kicked in by Costco again. And he gets a hug from the <laughs> buyer. I'm like, a hug? Like, I can't, like, what? I was blown away by that. And I was like, yeah. Mr. Big Fancy CPG executive guy, you know, with my yeah. deck. He's like, oh, we don't need a deck. And he just walks in there with the product and just his, honestly, his talent. And yeah. it makes it happen. So again, you back to your kind of like, oh, you know, we have the upstart food thing. Like, if, if you're re- the, the talent matters, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Like, alone and his ability to work with Costco. And it's not even really sales because that implies kind of this pushiness. It's really kind of this element of co-creation in, in working with them. And then you get the buyers emotionally invested. And then he understands all of the politics of Costco and all the different levers to pull, um, et cetera, et cetera. And he actually has since launched a pet treat brand in Costco, quick aside, where I told him, pet treats, you're crazy. Like that's the most competitive space in the world. Like don't do pet treats, like pick something else. And then sure enough, he did pet treats and he went from zero revenue to now he is in three regions of Costco, Costco working on nationwide distribution. So again, like he just has it where he co-creates these brands and he can get, you tell me a brand I can probably, he could probably get, get it into Costco, right? Yeah. So that, but that's not easy to replicate. So that back to your original question, not everyone has that. I, I don't even have that in, in that, that matters like a whole bunch. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I mean, there there is a talent uh, needed, and and it's uh, yeah, that's incredibly impressive. Because I even remember uh, there's a book. You, I mean, it, I don't know if you've read it. Uh, the Everything Store about Amazon. Oh um, yeah. Yeah, and Bezos, or you know, the whoever's writing that story, I'm like from Bezos's yeah. perspective, kind of like talks about Costco because Jeff Bezos admires them a lot as a business, but they do go into actually a lot of detail at one point of. Um, that Costco's business model and how much they like purposely beat up on suppliers because they don't really care in a way about suppliers. Their whole goal is to get the lowest possible price for their customer. Um, so yeah, really impressive that you know this for person sure. can just go in, go and in Costco's there. Costco's a, uh, a product based business, and that's why it was yeah. hard at Kraft Heinz. I could say, oh, I'm this big brand; they don't really care, and that's why. I mean, whole separate podcast on CPG, but the Costco fact, first model to CPG is brilliant. Because the economics worse, your cash flow positive on day one. And if you're the, the right emerging brand that fulfills a niche, Costco doesn't care that you're not the big brand, whereas like, you know, Kroger does. So uh, yeah, huge fan of Costco, uh, Kirkland yeah. Signature for life uh, for all of the products in my house, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, all right. Well, let's start learning about, I guess, yeah. Like how did you meet the Edwards family and how did, yeah, how did you kind of become what you are now, which is leading Milkshake Factory. And listeners, we are going to get to Milkshake Factory, the franchise, which has some pretty fantastic uh, unit economics and uh, a ton of growth so far. So, uh, you know, stay stay tuned for it. Um, but yeah, Dan, let's, let's, I guess, before getting to where you are today with Milkshake Factory, like, yeah, what was that first interaction like with the Edwards family? Uh, sure. So uh, my background, very, very briefly, I'm kind of the, the business guy of sorts for the Edwards family. So pretty traditional big business background, consulting, private equity portfolio, you know, full-time MBA, then post-MBA, went to work for Heinz uh, North America. Um, and that's in brand management. And that's where you own the whole P&L there for that brand management group. That's where I learned how to run a business. So, you know, I was leading brands like Heinz Ketchup, et cetera. And then I was there when the uh, 3G Capital acquisition had. So if any of your listeners are familiar with 3G Capital, they're the, um, we'll call them invasive Brazilian private equity firm that comes in and, and, and flips companies on their head. Um, so that's, again, a whole separate conversation. So that was a wild time, but I kept my head down and actually pretty quickly worked my way up through that organization. So I was, I was one of the youngest global partners of Heinz and 3G. And, you know, we were doing Super Bowl commercials and big product launches, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, in 2015 is when the Heinz and Kraft merger, uh, quote unquote, happened which was wild. So any of the CPG nerds out there, it was Heinz were looking at Unilever and then we ended up uh, merging with Kraft. So I was on yep. the one of the very, the, it was like a handful of us, boots on the ground at Kraft, integrating Kraft and Heinz. And then my last job there was was leading the uh, $2 billion condiment, Kraft Heinz condiments portfolio. So uh, it was pretty wild, you know, uh, 
heavy disruption to the corporate culture. You know, I used that the team used to be 80 and now it's six and they give it to me, the young guy to run. So, you know, I learned a ton, was grateful for that, but also, you know, to be very blunt, like I wasn't really having a whole lot of fun anymore. And I didn't really <laughs> think that the Kraft Heinz merger was going to work, at least not in the short term. Um, sadly, I ended up being right about that. So I was the first person to ever walk away from the partnership group. Uh, this wow. didn't make, didn't make a penny. Um, so that was something that was not a thing. Um, the CEO was like, what are you doing? And I, you know, in hindsight, I'm glad I did. So kind of one of those trust your gut moments. Yeah. Um, and you know, I knew that if I wanted to leave that, it was a lot of just, you know, big public company, fortune 150 pandering to wall street, quarterly earnings incentives. You know, it, I just wanted to grow yeah. the business. I wanted to build something. I didn't care about all that short term stuff. So, uh, I, I ended up meeting the Edwards family through a friend of a friend. You know, I was in Pittsburgh. They were in Pittsburgh. And okay. I got to, you know, kind of read their story. I was like, oh, this is super interesting. And then I tasted Snappers, the product. And it was a perfect intersection of, you know, I was kind of the big CPG guy of all the fundamentals and the training. And they had the product and the growth. And then I, the timing was perfect because a lot of people were jumping ship from Kraft Heinz. So I was able to bring essentially a world-class team uh, oh, not nice. seven or eight people over from graphic design to supply chain to marketing to, you know, on and on it goes. I was like, Hey, come over here. Let's do this thing. And, and that's what happened. So it was great learning for me, but you know, when I first met them, you know, you, as the big company, you overestimate how, or, or you underestimate just everything is figured out for you, right? Like if Heinz ketchup has a terrible year, they're down 3%. If they have a great year, they're up too, right? Then you come into the, the entrepreneurial company and cash is finite and you have to make payroll and it is yeah. real. So the numbers yep. are way smaller, but it actually felt much more intense. Um, yeah. So that was great learning for me. And I still laugh. Like the first day I show up, I'm like, all right, well, like, let's take a look at the price list. Like, oh, you don't have a price list. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, you know, on and on it goes. So there was yeah. a lot of work to be done, but like the, the, the bones were there. The people were there. The products were there. Um, so I led sales, marketing, and R&D uh, over the course of a couple of years. Ended up kind of parachuting into kind of what I'll call an emergency CFO role. So I was I was fake CFO for a bit. So that was great learning for me as well. Um, and went, went, we went through some kind of exiting manufacturing, transitioning the business model of chocolate, uh, et cetera. So that... I was deep in that chocolate business. I did a little bit with Milkshake Factory in like that 2016, 2017, just on kind of branding and menu and business fundamental stuff. But after we opened Milkshake Factory in 2016, that second store, in my heart, I was like, this brand, there is something to it, right? I've led all these big brands, marketing guys. I, I knew in the back of my mind, the day would come where we had to kind of see this one through. So yeah. transitioning to Milkshake Factory a little bit, you know, after we opened our second store, wildly successful, we ended up opening six more stores around Pittsburgh um, in 18 months. So that was pretty eventful uh, in, you know, urban stores, a college store at the University of Pittsburgh. And then we made the leap to the suburbs where basically we just kept opening stores and they kept being very successful. Right. And then the hard part was we opened our, I think it was our eighth store one week before COVID happened. So, you know, I pride myself in being pretty good at forecasting and financialing modeling, but we, we did not model for the zero revenue scenario, nor did anybody else in brick and mortar retail. So of course COVID was a wild time. We were completely shut down for many months. Um, but honestly, it kind of revolutionized our business and tightened up our labor model and enforced us to really, you know, uh, tighten a lot of things up and, and we got through it, uh, like a lot of strong businesses did. And then, you know, we got back to playing offense. We have since opened two more stores and then, you know, I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff, but we kind of had, you know, we're about, you know, we can maybe open a couple more stores in Pittsburgh, but you know, you're kind of at the point of, do you, do you want to own 10 stores in Pittsburgh, which is what we have? Do you want to expand via corporate model? Or there's this whole franchising thing that we didn't really know about. So we spent a yeah. lot of time last year educating ourselves. And I was even a little dismissive, wrongly in hindsight about franchising. I was like, oh, someone, you know, someone's just going to mess up your business. And then the more I learned, I was like, wait a minute, like we have the perfect business for franchising. So we didn't set out to be a franchise brand um, or anything like that. But that's where, you know, last year was kind of that aha saying, hmm, this franchising thing's kind of interesting. And it's a much, obviously, more capital efficient way to scale a business versus, you know, trying to raise money and, and go the corporate route. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, wow. Okay. That's, a, that's amazing. And so, uh, before this is the last thing before we fully transition to just the milkshake factory conversation, which is, uh, did you ever meet Warren Buffett? 
Because isn't he a, isn't he one of the yeah, biggest yeah, investors? Yeah. You oh, have- yeah. Yeah, you got to present to Warren. So Warren was part of the, yeah, he, yeah. Was, uh, he was big in the early days of the Kraft Heinz. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he was there and, you know, no super way. nice guy. But like, yeah, I, I'm not saying I'm like friends of Warren Buffett, but you know, he was there. He was <laughs> part of it. I don't want, I don't want to oversell here, but uh, sure. no, he was a part of it. And he was part of the architect of that deal. Obviously, I don't know his exact, you know, share of ownership, but it was, it was pretty large. Um, so yeah, I mean, wild times in terms of the people at that table and, and how that whole Kraft Heinz thing happened. And I still oh have a lot of friends God. there. They're actually seem to be doing really well here over the last couple of years. I'm, I'm cheering for them from the sidelines. So it's a, a yeah. pretty wild experiment in business uh, that, again, probably is a conversation for a different day. Ooh. For sure. For sure. Uh, okay, sick. I figured you would have at least been on the phone with them or something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's fascinating. Um, all right. So Milkshake Factory, I mean, like... I'm sure, like, right, you probably saw indicators of unit economics and and yada yada yada. But what do you think originally, like, before even getting to your early franchise success so far, um, like, what do you think made them successful? Because there wasn't necessarily like a brand care, like it was a new, different brand from like the Edwards family's chocolate business. Um, I mean, could there was it? Did like was there local buzz that the Edwards family could generate at least around Pittsburgh, or you know, what do you think? initially just i mean the milkshakes are phenomenal online so i'll give you that uh, but like the, the product marketing all that's fantastic uh but yeah if you had to like say like why do you think it took off obviously like selling milkshakes is not a novel concept like it's, right. it's been around yeah i think people love milkshakes right and milkshakes have been around I for love a century them. i know it's, it's yeah, a very controversial opinion and a lot of people you know you can get a milkshake anywhere you can go to mcdonald's you can go to shake shack you can go to your local ice cream yes. store and that's great but there's no one really has like planted their flag, so to speak, on like milkshakes are our thing, right? And and I am a huge believer of focus in business. Like if you're a pizza place, like do pizza. Be really, really good at pizza. Don't worry about pasta just yet, right? So like you can't get an ice cream cone in the milkshake factory. So I think part of it is, you know, this is what we do. This is what we are best at. And then you bring that four generations of just uh quality expertise from the Edwards family. And when we opened the second store, I mean, we retained, I mean, this, I'll kind of joke when I say this, but it's actually true. He's the, he's the best ice cream guy on the planet. He's the head of the Penn state university creamery, which is this legendary creamery, uh, you know, at Penn state university. And he is the most knowledgeable person about ice cream on planet earth, which is kind of a funny thing to say, but that's the level of quality that we had when we developed our ice cream recipe, which we, you know, we, we make it all in house and we have all fresh ingredients. We make our own whipped cream. So like we do all the hard stuff in, you know, all of the, there's Virginia Dare to vanilla. I mean, I could go on and on in terms of ingredient yeah. story. That's non-negotiable. So people come in and say, this is the best milkshake I've ever had. They might not fully understand why, but I think that's really what took off. And then I think, you know, when celebrities come to town and when, you know, movie stars come to town, they, everyone comes to the milkshake factory. So it kind of developed this cult following that again was not overnight it, but it, it was built over time and it's just a peop, it's a place people love to go i mean i've done so much with different brands and I, I, we, we tell our team this all the time and it's kind of cheesy but like people walk into our doors with a smile on their face like they're so pumped to walk into the milkshake factory like all we have to do is make sure they walk out with one right so great product clean store good service so i usually you know a lot of brands that i've been involved in like even i wear my milkshake factory shirt around a town that's never heard of it, people will stop me in an airport and say, what is that? I need to know everything about Milkshake Factory. That sounds awesome. And that's why I love the name so much is like you could put a sign up in any town in the country. People know what it is. There's no education required. Oh, it's a milkshake shop, right? Where I think a lot of businesses make mistakes in their naming where if people don't know what they are, what your business is when you drive by that sign at 50 miles an hour, that's a mistake, right? Like they need to know what it is. Um, so it's kind of the combination of all these things. Then there's this whole kind of nostalgia chocolate element to it as well. It's a very kind of comfortable, safe place to be. People want to hang out. People, it's the best first date spot in Pittsburgh. People get their engagement no photos way. at State Factory. You know, like there's wild stuff that happens. Nice. So, you know, it's not one silver bullet. I think it's like the, the sum of a lot of little and medium things that have kind of come together uh, in a pretty authentic way way that you know we just kind of realized like hey we just we're doing our thing and people seem to love it and that's why we keep opening all these stores and and it's exciting now which i know we'll get into franchising but people coming in from all over the country that say wow this is incredible 
Um, and we'll talk the operation in a second. And that's really the, yes. the secret here. But just by people just being so this visceral reaction and being so excited, uh, a quick, quick sidebar that kind of drives home this point. Uh, Dane Edwards was in the White House a couple of weeks ago because uh, she's always there. They're very plugged in and at a big event. And Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson were there sitting right in front of Tom, uh, So Dane and her husband are sitting yeah. right between Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks was in Pittsburgh uh, a while back filming, the, I think it was A Man Called Otto was the movie he just filmed. And very frequently, Tom Hanks would come to our milkshake factory store downtown. Just, you know, he'd, he'd bring his crew, just, you know, they'd done filming for the day. They'd come in, you know, we'd see him on the security camera, just standing in line and we're like, play <laughs> cool, everybody. You know, we don't like yeah, to harass yeah. the celebrities. So, you know, we're all nerding out like behind the scenes, but, you know, everyone, you know, we're not mobbing him and giving pictures and stuff. So he, he's sure. just a guy in line with a hoodie on and a hat like anybody else. Um, Love it. So, you know, cool. Okay. Tom Hanks comes in, you know, no big deal, really. But then what was amazing to me was Dana's husband in the White House pulled Tom Hanks aside and said, Hey, this is Dana, the founder of the milkshake factory. And Dana was expecting Tom Hanks to say, like, oh, you know, Dana would have to explain, okay, we're in Pittsburgh. It's that, it's this shop. You've been there a couple yeah. of times. But there's this amazing picture. Uh, I'll have to post it again. But Tom Hanks' jaw just drops to the floor and he is just, he, like, like he's meeting the celebrity of Dana and he's just <laughs> like, I love Milkshake Factory. Like it's going to take the world by storm. I can't believe I'm meeting you. And like, it was just such a genuine, authentic react. And Tom Hanks is a great guy. Right. But like, it's, it was just so authentic of like, oh my gosh, you're the founder of the Milkshake Factory. And literally the president of the United States is like five feet away. And Tom Hanks was just like locked in on Dana talking about the milkshake factory. So it's just like <laughs> a little anecdote that you yeah. need to talk about, but it also it shows the power of the brand that no one really reacts to many brands like that. And and that's just kind of this authentic thing that, that we just kind of are fortunate to have. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, there's so many good points to touch on there. And I agree, just like looking from at the website, I mean, it does have this, like you said, like the nostalgic, almost just like, I mean this in a good way, but like Willy Wonka chocolate factory yeah. vibes. Like it's just like it feels like a classic like yep. ice cream shop almost. So which is what you want. Um and yeah, I love the point you said about I never I never thought of it that way, but I guess like you know, why not, right? Like you guys have planted your flag and you're building your brand around one product, right? The milkshake. And right, I mean I think uh one of my favorites who have who's done this incredibly they're not a franchise or at least like 98 percent of their stores aren't uh but raising canes right i mean yeah i mean they have five menu items all really? chicken finger based and they are doing like i forget what the latest one i think it's like four and a half million in average in volume oh it's crazy so like, yeah outrageous numbers and like i mean i i was confused until i moved to austin texas and started <laughs> you know eating there and then i had like a i had a problem those things are so good and right. that's all they do so like that's why and there's an amazing clip of uh, the founder, uh, Todd Todd Graves, I believe. Yeah. Um, you know, he's talking about how someone asked, like, hey, like, why don't you like add more like yeah. items? It's been 24 years and like you're killing it. So like, what's the big deal? Like, just give us some more options. And he's like, no, like, he's like, we do one thing, we do it well. Everything is so dialed in. He's like, even my drive through speed time, just by having more options would like our service speed would go down because people would just be sitting in the drive through line reading the menu more. He's like, people just, it's yeah. like clockwork. Like, so there's so many little things that, and nuances that you don't really realize, I guess, just as a customer, right. Of, of how valuable it can be for a business to just be the best at one thing. So I love yeah. that you guys are doing that. Um, I'm really curious about, I mean, this Penn state university creamery person, uh, that's interesting. Like, is that like a, for formulating the ice cream and, and like, that's a, an edge that you guys have where if I was starting an ice cream brand, like. I'd probably buy it from a supplier, right? Like versus I mean, yeah, having it's, some it's worlds yeah. apart. It's a whole different okay. animal. And like, even, you know, you could go buy the best premium ice cream off the shelf at Whole Foods. That's $14 for a pint or whatever egregious price. Like, yeah, it's still not going to be that. Right. So that's kind of where, and it's just this obsession with detail. And even, even me, I've been in the business, like I'm not sophisticated enough to know like the little different notes of subtle vanilla hint versus sample A versus sample B. I, I wish I was the, you know, like the pretty of the friend that's like really into the wine and they can tell all the different notes. Like that's awesome. I wish I had that. I don't. But then you say with the Edwards family and they're like, oh, B is offensive and A is amazing. And I'm sitting there just like, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> um, but like that obsession with quality, then you layer on folks like the Penn State Creamery guy, like it, it, the standard is just could not possibly be higher. And, and that's something, yeah. even as we scale, 
Like that's our entire business. And, and like, we're really, we get really fired up about protecting that quality because the second, you know, it's, it's always tempting and you see all the countless business cases as you scale, you start to cut corners and yes. then, you know, I mean, you kind of know how that story ends. So that's something sure. that we are very, very firm about. And even, you know, um, for some of our, our vendor partners say, Hey, this, this product is good enough for everybody else. Why isn't it good enough for you? And like, well, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> it's not right. So, um, yeah. yeah, that, that standard I think is, is, I mean, honestly, it's like the cornerstone of our whole business. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad we touched on that. Cause I think it's easy for a lot of people. I'm like, you know, I've gotten just as my like, Twitter account has grown, you know, the replies, uh, sometimes when I'm talking about a franchise, like, uh, crumble cookies is an example. And I, I guarantee just based on your success so far, like I'll be tweeting about you and, you know, you know, a few weeks and then in six months and people will say, oh, like it's just a milkshake. Like anyone could start this. So like, why are they special? And like, that's what they say about Crumble. And just as you said, I mean, like, I mean, I, we had Jason McGowan, co-founder and CEO of Crumble on and they are obsessed. I mean, the, at first they were just obsessed with chocolate chip cookies. Like yeah. that's it. They didn't care about anything else. And so, yeah, I think uh, it's good for an entrepreneur and potential franchise buyer to realize that, you know, with good concepts, I mean, sure, like a chocolate chip cookie is a commodity, but uh, quality, you know, and that obsession uh, does make a difference for a concept. And it's becoming apparent to me over the course of this 35 minute conversation so far that uh, you guys, I mean, you know, I haven't had it yet, but I would love to at some point. Um, but I, I would imagine that there's a, a pretty massive difference and, and that does make a difference, you know, right for, for the business. Um, and, and so, yeah, um, super, super interesting. And that's, it's just, that's such a great edge that, yeah, like if I was to start, uh, the Wolf's milkshake factory, <laughs> like I'm not going to have this, this, uh, that edge of, of the formula. For sure. Um, and I always ask like, you know, we've been at this for, you know, seven years, our VP of ops has been with us for seven years who has a franchising background. So when he started, it was a bunch of kids hand scooping all these different flavors of ice cream and have since transitioned it. Like it is the most operationally simple business you can imagine. Uh, and, and it's all made out of our, our, our in-house made vanilla base. Uh, again, if you have a spoon of it, it's, it's the best vanilla ice cream you ever had. We don't even serve nice. it. It's just the base to the milkshakes. And, you know, just to give a hint of, you know, if you go to your local ice cream shop and order a milkshake, you know, it might be pretty good, but the line comes to a screeching halt. So I'm not going to give away yes. all of our operational secrets, but the, the, the key for okay. our business is all of this quality we've talked about layered on with incredible operational efficiency and speed. So we have a, a, a location in the PPG Paints Arena where the Penguins play hockey. And our record for milkshakes served this hockey season is 714. And that's essentially in, in one three, hockey game. Or it's match. like really three 20 minute windows is what it is. Yeah. It's 20 minutes before the game It's first intermission and a second intermission. And that's it. So the line can be, you know, 150 people long in the concourse and we can just hammer through it. But again, efficiency alone, that doesn't get you very far. So you have to meet that brand quality standard every single time. So it's really the intersection of that efficiency and speed with the quality. That's the secret sauce. So you'll come to any of our stores on a Friday night. The line can literally be out the door. And again, I love a line. It's the best marketing in the world. But like you can't stand in line for 40 minutes for a milkshake, right? So it's all about speed and efficiency. Um, so that's kind of the secret sauce when you know people see, oh, you're an emerging brand and you're so risky. It's like, well, we've been doing this for a very, very long time and we have 10 stores open. Like, you know, at store number four, we weren't ready to have this conversation. And we just kind of opened yeah. up as prototype store back in March with hyper efficient, capital efficient layout in our VP of... VP of ops, who, who doesn't get nearly enough credit for how good he is. I mean, he's sitting in a dirt floor construction site, mock making milkshakes, like optimizing every square inch of that floor plan. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great when people from the franchising world come in and they're blown away by our operation saying, wow, like this is incredibly buttoned up, especially for how young you are. So again, we didn't necessarily know that, but it's always validating to kind of hear that yeah. from, from experts in the space. Because with franchising, as you know, like if you don't have that, it's going to be it's going to be a, a rough road. I don't care how good your product is. No, for sure. And it's funny. I mean, I, I won't. Uh, yeah, because I don't want you to have to uh, expose your operational secrets. But uh, you're dead right. Like my uh, my older brother actually used to work in an ice cream shop, like uh, in the summers when we were younger. And uh, he he said he's like him and all the employees they hated it when someone ordered a milkshake because yep. they had to, like. <laughs> scoop it into this blender and the blender half the time did it work and then the line would slow down but then they had to clean it and it was like they always would like you know put behind the scenes be rolling their eyes yep uh so it's i'm curious yeah it's just interesting that that's all you guys do so it's obviously a different setup but um wow 
Uh, this is uh, this is fascinating. I mean, all right. Well, let's talk about franchising. So, I think you said last year you did a ton of research, right, into right. the franchise world before really like going to market with the franchise opportunity. And and look, I've talked. I mean, I've, I don't even know how many podcast episodes I've done. But anyone who's followed me closely, I mean, this is this is the bread and butter. Is like how to grow, how to scale, do's and don'ts, potential red flags, all that good stuff. Like. There's so many ways you can choose to grow your franchise. I mean, you could bring a development team in house. You can use franchise brokers out the wazoo, which is going to sap up all your franchise fee commission revenue. And so you're going to have to maintain cash flow from other sources or hope you get to royalty self sufficiency. Um, so you guys have done something interesting. And I think, one, it's not something that any brand can do, but you've partnered with Franworth as well as Repum for franchise yep. sales. So, um, and again, folks, like not any, the, those two companies are just going to partner with any emerging franchise. So it is a, a, a solid indicator at a minimum that they were able to even get a partnership with them. But yeah, can you talk to me about, especially your background, like your suit, you, I, it's obvious you're very analytical. You clearly have a ton of business acumen. Um, why go that route with Friendworth and Repum? Which there are, and you know, we don't have to discuss the finite details, but there are obviously, um, you know, compensa- performance based compensation that those companies get. That theoretically, if you did it all yourself, right, you would have that upside. Um, so yeah, well, what was your thought process that, that ended up leading you to partnering with them versus doing it internally? Sure. No, I think it's a great question. And, you know, where we were, you know, ask me two years ago, I'm like, oh yeah, franchising, you put a tab on the website and you sell franchises. How hard can it be? Right. (laughs) So that's how naive I was two years ago. And then last year, as I started, you know, having a lot of informational calls and educating myself, um, I was like, okay, there's a little more that meets the eye here. And, and, and honestly, like I think of everything and of course there's always exceptions and outliers and people that can beat the odds and, and have tremendous growth in spite of odds. But you know, uh, these are the numbers and forgive me if I'm not exactly right, but I think there's 3,500 franchise brands in the country. 2,600 of those are under 100 units. And then only 5% of that 2,600 will ever get there, there being 100 units. So a hundred units is a rough indicator of what it takes to be at royalty sufficiency. Can you do it with 50 as a certain brand? Of course. But like roughly speaking, as a brand new emerging franchise brand, you have a 5% chance of success. That's what those numbers mean. Now you could say, oh, we're better. So, you know, we're 20 or whatever. But bottom line, the odds are not in your favor. And and you need to be well capitalized. And to do it, you will likely need to spend a fair amount of money. So where I sat, I was like, huh, okay. I don't love those odds. How do we stack the deck in our favor, right? There's no, there's no guarantees in life, right? The world is an uncertain place. But, you know, myself and, and Dana, the founder, we said, all right, if we're, we believe in our brand, we believe in our team, we believe in our product. However, how do we, how do we increase our chances of a successful outcome here, whatever that ends up being? And that's when we realized we need to get as many franchise experts on our team as possible. We can do the business stuff. We can talk about milkshakes all day. But I kind of equip, uh, think about franchising as the franchisor level, you're kind of walking through a minefield, right? And there's some big mines you can step on and it could almost be game over very early. So I'm like, I need experts to hold my hand walking through that minefield. It doesn't mean it's perfect, but we can't step on any of the, we can't make any of the big mistakes. And it's so complicated, everything, even just right out of the gate, you've got to pull together your initial FDD. Like that is a huge, it, pick yes. any section of that FDD there are a lot of mistakes to be made. There are a lot of landmines to step on and a lot of strategic errors that you can make. So long story short, you know, I talked to a good, I won't say every, but a, a lot of the franchise development companies around the country. Again, a lot of great people in this space. Um, but when we met Franworth, uh, they were wonderful, great fit. I mean, phenomenal expertise and resume. I mean, they have multiple IFA entrepreneurs of the year. I mean, Drew Brees is on their board. They've all been big time CEOs of massive franchise organizations. They've scaled them from zero to 500 units many, many times. Um, yeah. Not to mention they're just great people, but, and you mentioned this earlier, they get 400 inquiries per year and they'll maybe do one or two deals, right? So, uh, you know, I, I actually live in Ann Arbor where, where they're based and I, I kind of walked in off the street and met, met their founder and, and president. And I was like, oh, these guys are going to laugh me out of the room. And then luckily we kind of hit it off. And I got them to Pittsburgh and I'm like, somehow I got these guys to Pittsburgh, but now they're going to laugh us out of the room with our little milkshake (laughs) shop. And, you know, they were so blown away and so complimentary. 
which was great. Like we didn't really know, right? So to hear that level of validation from this quality of people in the franchising space was great. So, and then they work as a kind of a fractional resource model. So they'll have eight to 10 brands at once. And they have a yep. whole suite of executive teams, you know, IT leader, marketing leaders, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I couldn't afford anyone, any individual on their team. And now I have access to all of them. They have in-house legal counsel, in-house finance. So they handle all our back house, back office stuff. Um, so they, and they have other great brands too, um, which I encourage people, people to, to research. Um, you know, Lash Lounge is a big business for them, you know, Garage Kings, Health Source Chiropractic. So I joke that we're the, we're the F&B, a food and beverage brand that for companies that don't want F&B. So Franworth doesn't do F&B, but then they made the exception for us. Repum doesn't do F&B, but they're like, okay, we'll make an exception for you guys. <laughs> um, so, so that's kind of the Franworth partnership. They've been awesome. I can't say enough nice things about them. And then they actually have a partnership with Repum, which is the franchise sales organization, um, that we also utilize and they've been fantastic. And, you know, franchise sales is a whole wild world of just trying oh, to yeah. get, navigate that funnel of lead volume and try to get the best quality people, you know, to, to our table. And there's a lot of things that go into that, uh, to put it very politely. And, you know, we're being very selective too. Like we know how important it is to our first 10, 20, 30 franchisees, like we're going to live and die with these people just because someone has a pulse and a little bit of money in their pocket does not mean like we can, we, we call, we, we award franchises. We don't sell them, which is a very yep. important distinction. Um, so the Repham team's helping us, us with that. And then we also, uh, have the build em team, which is a sister kind of subsidiary of Repham. And that helps our franchisees from the second you sign your FA all the way until you get your doors open. So everything from site selection, GC selection, bid leveling, permitting, managing that GC project, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, you know, for anyone who's done it, we did it 10 times ourselves in Pittsburgh, took about 10 years off my life uh, of just the things <laughs> that can happen, right? Of like you permitting alone, like you pick any ste step in that process, it can be very hard. So we are basically providing an army of support for our franchisees to ensure that they're successful. And then you layer that on with, you know, being pretty selective of that funnel. And I've been pretty blown away by the quality of people that have come to come to our table and come to our discovery days. We've only had two, but you know, we, we've signed deals already and, and we can get into that if you like. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, I, I think you're right. And if there's emerging franchisors or someone who's thinking about starting, you know, franchising their business, right. Uh, there is a lot. Um, there's, there's legal, uh, questions. Um, there's, yeah, there's the sales process, the due diligence process. I mean, that, that's where my, a lot of my experience comes from is franchise development. So, I mean, you know, uh, that's all my, my past company did. And, um, yeah, I mean, there's so much, so for some, a new brand, a new business who like you guys have an expertise in, uh, running a milkshake factory, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like that's a whole business, but then franchising it is an, is business number two. So it's a whole new learning curve. Uh, the tech stack, the vendors you're supposed to use, you know, uh, I mean, there's so many things to do. And so I do agree. And not that it can't be done um, on your own, but uh, it's it, it'll it'll definitely take longer than if you were to uh, partner with someone. And again, there you do decrease the odds of success just from a mathematical standpoint. I, yeah. So I would agree with all that. Um, I know we're, we're coming up on time here, but uh, yeah, I mean, look, you're you're pretty new to franchising and you said you had two discovery days. Um, I know you came into, and look, folks, I'll probably mention these guys and, and maybe even break down the numbers in a newsletter at some point, but uh, I can confirm that the numbers are phenomenal. Uh, they absolutely meet the standard to be featured in the Wolf Report. So if you read the newsletter, um, just know that uh, no BS, it, it's it's a legit um, corporate store performance that they're, they've been showing. And so, yeah, how has the reception been? I, you know, uh, I don't like, because as I can tell, you guys are focused on franchisee success. So I don't want this to be uh, like, you know, I, I don't want to overly focus on units sold, but just for an idea of where you're at from the growth side. I mean, you know, how how, how many, you know, do you guys have deals done um, yeah. and, and at what scale? Sure. So yeah, I, uh, and, and again, I, I give a ton of credit. I'll be forever loyal to our early franchisees. It takes, a, I don't care what the business is. It takes a very courageous soul oh, yeah. to be first, right? So actually there's an amazing story. I will get into it all, but a, a friend from a decade ago at Kraft Heinz, I was the intern. He was the associate brand manager. We kind of went our separate career paths that we got re uh, 
uh, kind of reunited and he was looking for a career change. So long story short, uh, he bought six milkshake factories in the Metro Salt Lake market, which is a nice. market I love. So he was our first franchisee. I will love him forever for it. I will support him to the end of this earth. Um, it's good, you know, to, to be first is really take something, right? And then we've since signed another four pack in Dallas, Fort Worth. And then we've got a whole bunch um, pending here. So I expect, you know, after, you know, we just had our, our second discovery day uh, two days ago in Pittsburgh, which is wonderful. Uh, just a fantastic group of accomplished people. You know, almost everyone's looking at multi-unit, um, you know, a, I want A-plus operators and A-plus markets, like really simply put. So I expect yeah. we'll probably have around 30 units signed um, by the end of next month, give or take. So, you know, off to a great start. But again, like, I could have sold more than that, right? Like we've had to say no to people. So like, yes, yeah. obviously as the franchisor, you need to grow. You, you, that's, that's how the business works. But, you know, people ask me, how many units sold do you want in the next year? I'm like, I, I don't, I don't like that question because I think yeah. it sets up kind of a perverse incentive structure where, you know, I, I could bring everyone, I could probably sell 200 if I wanted to, but like, yep. is that the right thing for the business? Like probably not, right? So that's kind of that balance that we're always trying to walk. You know, we got to get people on board, but uh, so far, you know, we've been very blessed with a, what I call kind of a very, very wide funnel at the top. So if you get a lot of people in, you can be pretty selective and still sell yes. pretty decent volume. So, uh, so yeah, it's been really exciting and almost flattering that people love the business so much. And, you know, I get pretty fired up just talking about supporting our early franchisees because it, it just matters to us. Like we take that so seriously that they believe in us and believe in our product. Like, everything we do and we're over investing in already in their success. It's not like, Oh, we're going to wait to have that new website done by the, you know, that's two you two years. Like, no, no, no. It's all happening right now. So on day yep. one, when our first franchisee opens, they're successful. So yeah, we, we get pretty fired up about that. Fantastic. Yeah. And I mean, congrats on the other success. That's amazing. Um, you know, that's not easy to do, uh, to come out of the gates that strong and, uh, I'm sure it'll continue. And, and yeah, I, I like that you, uh, are kind of resistant to setting that goal. It actually, it's, it's not a perfect comparison, but it reminded me when I was like trying to grow my audience on Twitter and people would ask me like, oh, what's your like goal for this year to like grow your follower count? And I was like, one, it's unpredictable. Like you, like it's not like uh, a linear expectation. Yeah. Content especially is like the most random game <laughs> of like, you never know when you're going to hit an inflection yeah. point. Um, but I just said, hey, like I'm focusing on the inputs and putting out quality and i'm going to do x tasks like x long threads x deep dives in my newsletter uh per week or per month whatever and i was just like if i do a good job of that i i know at some point the fo the the attention and all that good stuff will follow so yeah um i'm sure there's something similar for you guys yeah, where action, okay, just, right like you know if we're yeah. keep doing our thing and we keep you know doing what we think is right for our business some one month we might sell no units and the next month we might sell 40 or you know whatever right like 100 percent that like will happen have yeah the, the one and post that is cricket so you might have the post that goes viral you don't even know why but like yeah as long as you're doing the work consistently yes. And I think people underestimate what consistently really means, yeah, right? A hundred percent. That's not once every two weeks. Um, so that's day in, day out. And it's a bit of a yeah. grind. It can be a bit of a lonely oh, grind sure. too, which I'm sure you can relate yes. to. Of like, man, oh, yeah. I'm putting all this work in. Does anybody care? So, you know, even for us, we obviously put many, many years into this business. And we kind of had that even in COVID of like, you know, you know, what, what, what does anyone care? Is this, is it, we onto something with this? So it, it's been so rewarding to, you know, you've probably seen it, whatever you've hit your inflection point of, of growth, whatever that means of like, okay, like. It was worth it. Like people do yes. king. like that. That feels good. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it's amazing. Um, yeah. It fires you up and it's kind of like, uh, it's like a whole new remotivating right. fresh start. We're like, all right, like I'm, I'm back. Uh, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's good. Um, amazing. Well, uh, look, Dan, it's been an awesome conversation. Uh, been super interesting to hear your story, the Edwards family story and, and milkshake factories kind of rise uh, to the franchising world. And, you know, again, congrats on the great start. Um, you know, if people want to follow you or milkshake factory uh, online, is there any good spots to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, best uh, website, milkshakefactory.com. You know, this is kind of our handmade website that we did in COVID uh, on Wix for $30 a month. So be, 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 be nice. Uh, we actually just, <laughs> just just retained a world-class uh, food and beverage marketing agency to completely overhaul the website. So uh, be on the lookout for that in, in, a, in a handful of months. Um, but that's the best place, best place to find us. 
And then uh, myself, I've, I've been encouraged by, by several people to be a little more active on Twitter. And so I've only been doing it for a couple months, but it's been really fun to interact with people. So you can find me there. Uh, I'm at Dan Reese, R-E-S-E 21. So, you know, I try to be pretty transparent about our journey and everything else that's going on. So I've uh, been having a lot of fun engaging with the Twitter community. And I also shout out my guy, uh, JT Singh. He's, he leads finance yes. for Franworth. And he was actually the one that said, hey, you got to get on Twitter. And we actually sourced a bunch of organic leads from Twitter. So Twitter, oh, yeah. from a business perspective alone, like I could tell you how much money it's it's basically effectively made our business uh, in the first couple months of doing this. So highly encourage any of you lurkers out there, just start, just get put yourself out there, tell your story, engage. Um, so JT's awesome. He's probably one of the best followers in all of franchising. He's at franchise M and A, and that's just the letters M and A. So definitely check him out. He's posting about all sorts of brands, emerging brands, and you know, given his role at Franworth, you know, he sees those 400 leads a year that I talk about. He sees them all, right? So he's he's probably a better follower than I am. But uh, if you want to follow me as well, I, I, I try to. I'm trying to do a better job of putting myself out there. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's tough when you are, uh, you know, running a business uh, day to day. So uh, I get it. But um, I second all that. Uh, JT's a great follow. He, and yes, he connected us. So grateful for that. Um, yeah, love Dan. Uh, thanks again. And, and folks, we'll plug all those links in the show notes. If you're on Twitter, follow follow them. Um, and yeah, uh, if you're looking to buy an exciting new franchise, uh, it's absolutely at least worth it to check them out and you know, uh, see how, uh, some, some high performing emerging brands and, and what that's supposed to look like. Cause I think it's clear milkshake factories at that level. Um, so yeah, Dan, uh, thanks again. And, uh, I'm sure we'll stay in touch. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having me. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Thanks for listening to franchise empires. We're coming to you soon with actionable insights to take the next step on your franchise journey. So make sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen.